I'm here to talk about mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is the biggest problem facing the criminal justice system today. In fact, I would say that given its human and racial and monetary cost, outside of climate change, it's the biggest domestic problem in our country today. Now, I'm going to argue, I'm going to suggest that algorithms can help us deal with this problem can help us deal with this mass incarceration problem. So it's interesting that I follow the last speaker. I think algorithms can actually help us do something about the serious mass incarceration problem that we have. Um, now, I know algorithms are not at the top of everyone's list of favorite things. In fact, when I was thinking about writing a book about how algorithms could improve and reform our criminal justice system, I told my wife about it, and she said, don't do it. <laughs> uh, algorithms have a very bad name these days. Well, I wrote the book anyway, but I did take my wife's concern to heart. Um, my argument is that algorithms can help, but only if they're used very carefully. If properly implemented, I think algorithms can be the key way we can finally do something about our incarceration situation. So what is our incarceration situation? I want to say a few words about that before I talk about how algorithms can help. Well, as you can see, back in the 1970s, we imprisoned about 96 people per 100,000 folks in our population. Today, we imprison 600 people per 100,000. That's a 600% increase. Fully 1% of our population between the ages of 15 and 65 is in an American jail or prison. We have about 4% of the world's population. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, we have about 5% of the world's crime. But we have 25% of the world's prisoners just under 2 million uh, as of the latest count. That means that our incarceration rate is six times that of Western Europe's, and our average sentence is three times the length of the average Western European sentence. We even manage to have 300,000 more prisoners than China does, which has four times our population. So as a result, we have a very expensive system. In fact, the estimate, the most recent estimate is direct and indirect costs is roughly $500 billion a year for our prison system. That is about a quarter of our GDP. And worse, as you can see from this study, and it summarizes the findings of a number of other studies, our incarceration binge has not had a big effect on crime rates. We do not get a big bang for our incarceration buck. Now, why is that? Well, for one thing, the economy has a lot more to do with crime rates than the number of prisons we have. But it's also true that prisons can be criminogenic. Uh, prisons can teach people how to be better criminals. It can also prevent people from acquiring the skills, uh, getting the jobs, and acquiring the families that can help people stabilize and keep them out of trouble when and if they do get out of prison. Uh, but you might ask, what about deterrence? Well, certainly, the prospect of prison does deter people. But making sentences longer and longer and longer, as we've been doing for the last 50 years, does not have a deterrent effect. According to the National Academy for Sciences, for instance, adding five years to a 10-year sentence gives us virtually no deterrent impact. And it's also the case that a lot of people just aren't deterrable. This is one of my all-time favorite titles of an academic article picking pockets at the hanging of a pickpocket. Back in merry old England, lots of pickpockets got the death penalty. But they were so unconcerned about that that they would actually pick pockets at the execution of one of their own. So our prison system does not do a very good job of reducing crime, and it's incredibly expensive. As a result, people from all points of the political spectrum have joined reform movements with names like Smart on Sentencing. Uh, so there have been proposals to decriminalize certain offenses, such as possession of small amounts of marijuana. Uh, there have been proposals to 
divert people through drug courts. There have been proposals to create alternatives to prisons and, of course, proposals to shorten sentences. But none of these reforms have had any effect or only had minimal effect on our incarcerated population. Why? Because it's all aimed at low-hanging fruit. Okay. Decriminalization, drug courts, alternatives to prison, they all target low-level nonviolent offenders who probably won't see much prison time to begin with. And yes, shortening sentences will shorten sentences, but again, that's been a very tough sell, except with respect to the low-hanging fruit, non-violent offenders. If we really want to do something about mass incarceration, much more drastic action is needed than what's been talked about so far. Uh, for instance, a study that just came out recently found that the average sentence for serious offenders has actually gotten longer in the last five years, despite all this reform noise that I've just been talking about. So how can we do anything about mass incarceration when legislatures and apparently society at large seem so hell-bent on punishing offenders harshly? How can we do anything about this when our society, culturally speaking, seems to be very punitive? Well, I think the results of this study, which has been replicated a lot of other places, gives us the seeds of an answer. As you can see here, Wisconsin citizens are willing to reduce the sentences of both nonviolent and violent offenders halfway through their term if the offenders can demonstrate that they're no longer a threat to society. People do want to punish criminals, but they also and are most worried about being harmed by criminals. And the citizens of Wisconsin are willing to significantly reduce sentences, even for violent offenders, if they can be sure these folks won't do it again. Well, as it turns out, over 90% of the folks who are released from prison will not commit a serious violent crime after release. In fact, only about four to, excuse me, six to eight uh, percent are likely to commit a serious violent crime like aggravated assault, homicide, rape, or robbery. If we could identify the six to eight percent and reserve the longest sentences for them, and give everyone else lesser sentences, we'd be going a long way towards taking care of a mass incarceration problem without significantly undermining public safety. The trouble is we haven't devoted a whole lot of effort to figuring out who is in the six to eight percent, who is going to commit a serious violent crime if they're let out of prison. And that is where algorithms, or what I'll call risk assessment instruments, or RAIs, come in. Now, what is an RAI? Well, it's an algorithm, simply put, that consists of a number of risk factors, like you see here. Uh, criminal history, substance abuse history, personality traits, and various other factors. Statistics are used to identify the factors that are most closely related to reoffending, and statistics are also used to assign weights to those risk factors depending upon how useful they are. So how can these kinds of algorithms help us deal with the mass incarceration situation? Well, if we can differentiate between high and low risk offenders, we can sentence accordingly. Those who are high risk would receive the maximum sentence or something close to it. Those who are low risk would receive a mere fraction of that sentence or maybe even be put just on supervised release. All of these people would be eligible for rehabilitation programs designed to reduce risk. And with the money we save out of that $500 billion that I mentioned earlier from releasing people early, we could create and improve these rehabilitation programs. An econometrician friend of mine calculated that we might be able to reduce the American prison population by 70% in 10 years if we adopt something along the lines of what I've been talking about. How would that be possible? Because so many people in prison today are at low risk of committing a serious crime after release. Take Sintoya Brown, a case that's well known here in Tennessee. At the age of 16, she was sentenced to life for murder with no opportunity for parole for 51 years. That's a standard life sentence here in Tennessee. Um, 51 years seems like a pretty long time for someone like Sintoya, especially since within seven years, she had obtained a degree from Lipscomb University in a program provided prisoners, and she had also found religion. Governor Haslam agreed, and he granted her clemency after 15 years. But I have to say, that probably would not have happened had her case not caught the attention of Kim Kardashian and Rihanna and a number of other celebrities, and had it not also caught the attention of a number of lawyers who were willing to put an immense amount of effort into seeking her release. Okay? So she was able to be released, but that's not going to happen in the run-of-the-mill case. 
There are over 150 people in Tennessee prison right now serving a mandatory 51-year sentence, just like Centoya was. And it's very unlikely the governor will do anything about any of those people. And yet if the data I was talking about earlier is correct, many of those people, perhaps most of those people, are low risk. And algorithms can help us identify who they are without depending upon whether a Kardashian or the governor or lawyers know about the case and take an interest. So algorithms can make a big dent in our mass incarceration problem. But they are, as you might guess, the subject of vigorous criticism. And I want to focus on three. Uh, the first criticism is that, or at least the first contention is, that they are not very good at identifying who's high risk as opposed to medium risk as opposed to low risk. The second criticism is that they're biased, racially and otherwise. And the third criticism is, even if those first two concerns can be overcome, it's simply wrong to sentence someone based on what they might do in the future. Well, with respect to the inaccuracy criticism, it is true that RAIs will produce error. Some people who are identified as low risk will commit crime if they're released, and some people who are designated uh, high risk would not have committed crime had they been released. But the important thing to keep in mind with respect to the inaccuracy criticism is if we are going to assess risk, if we are going to engage in risk assessment, algorithms are much better at it than humans. Okay, here are the results of a study that analyzed the results of a number of, of other studies. And as you can see, it found that there's overwhelming evidence that structured judgment using risk assessment instruments are more accurate and more reliable than unstructured, subjective, intuitive judgment. This is the finding of study after study. Here's, a, here's one study uh, out of Kentucky which looked at the impact of introducing an RAI. And as you can see, almost immediately after introduction of the RAI, judges started releasing individuals at a much higher rate, as represented by the blue line. Okay. At the same time, the crime rate, which is represented by the orange line, stayed the same. That's exactly what we want to have happen. We want release rates to go up without crime rates going up. But you'll also notice that after a while, release rates went back down. So what was occurring there? Well, judges abandoned the RAI. They went back to using their intuition. They went back to using their experience. The judges thought they were better at risk assessment than the RAI. Unfortunately, they were wrong. And that's the constant finding of these kinds of studies. The second criticism is not so much that algorithms are inaccurate, but that they're particularly inaccurate with respect to people of color. And the claim here is that algorithms are based on what some people call dirty data. That's information that's infected by the structural racism that permeates the criminal justice system and society at large. So just as Amazon tells us what books we will like based on books we have liked, the contention here is that risk algorithms will tell us who's going to commit crime based on who's committed crime in the past. A fact that because of structural racism and in particular racialized policing uh, could be correlated with race. I think the response to this criticism was well put by Senator Malayathan who pointed out that biased algorithms are easier to fix than biased people. Okay? Just as algorithms are, in general, more accurate than humans, they're less likely to be racially skewed. And more importantly, racial bias in algorithms can be fixed, are more easily corrected. Why? Because the inner workings of algorithms can be examined. We can force RAIs to reveal their inner workings. That's a lot harder to do with humans. The inner workings of humans are much more mysterious, and very often, humans don't even realize they're biased. Now, to make sure that we can fix the bias in algorithms if it does exist, we need to make sure that they're transparent, which means, for instance, if an algorithm is developed by a private company, that company can't hide behind trade secret laws. And if an algorithm is based on artificial intelligence, it should not be used at all in the criminal justice system unless we can investigate its internal logic. Um, I talk about all these issues in my book at great length, and I end up coming to the conclusion that algorithms are much more accurate and less biased than humans when it comes to risk assessment. But even if you agree with that conclusion, the third criticism is that we can't use RAIs because the entire risk assessment enterprise is flawed. Okay, the idea here is that punishment should never be based on what a person might do in the future, but should only be based on what a person's crime is what a person has done in the past. Now, I don't disagree. I think 
Offenders deserve to be punished, and their sentences should reflect what they've done. But if we want to do something about mass incarceration, um, it would be a huge mistake to rely entirely on what legal beagles call retribution or just desert. Because if we did that, we would get right back into the incarceration mess that started back in the 1970s. It's retributive thinking that got us into the mass incarceration problem that we have today. Um, so, this is a short history lesson about what our criminal justice system did back in the 70s. Before the, the 1970s, many states had parole boards, which often released people early based on risk. They weren't necessarily that good at it, partly because they didn't have algorithms, but at least they were trying to release people based on risk. However, in the 70s and 80s, many states got rid of their parole boards or severely limited their authority, all in an effort to focus punishment on blameworthiness, on what the person's crime was, on just desert. Okay? And I think this idea is very well expressed in the title of a statute passed by Congress in 1985 called the Truth in Sentencing Law. The idea behind this law was to make sure people serve their maximum sentence or something close to it. But it's precisely at that point when these laws were being passed, parole boards authority were being limited, that sentences went through the roof and that incarceration rates skyrocketed. Uh, unfortunately, when we focus on retribution as the sole purpose of punishment, we tend to get very punitive. If we ignore risk as a consideration in deciding whether or not to release someone, we're likely to be stuck with very long sentences for some time to come. As I've said, if we want to do something about mass incarceration, drastic action is needed, not a reinforcement of our punitive appetites. Risk algorithms that can tell us who is low risk, who can be released early, may be the best way possible to finally do something about the biggest problem facing our criminal justice system today. At least I think that approach is worth a try. Thank you.